I feel really tall. Um, so good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you out here to, uh, to the LBJ School. Uh, my name is Jay Hartzell. I'm the president of the University of Texas at Austin. And I want to say on behalf of Dean J.R. DeShazo of the LBJ School of Public Affairs, Dean Claudia Moore of the Jackson School of Geosciences, and Dean Heather Woofter of the UT School of Architecture, our newest dean. Where are you, Heather? Uh, welcome, Heather. Um, I want to welcome all of you here to UT Austin. I want to say special thanks to Mayor Kirk Watson and all of our esteemed guests for being here with us this morning for an exciting announcement. And of course, a big thanks to Congressman Lloyd Doggett, uh, who is really the reason that we're all gathered here this morning. Today, we're unveiling a new UT Austin-led initiative with the City of Austin and other community partners to provide data and other tools to Texas communities about city climate, extreme heat, and other extreme weather events. Many of us have suffered through the last several weeks, and we would call this uh, extreme heat. Texans, though, were built a little bit differently, and for us, this is a fall morning, perfect for an outdoor gathering on the lawn. The truth, however, is that extreme weather and other climate stressors like drought and heat are no joke, and they pose critical risks to central Texas communities like ours. This project aims to use artificial intelligence, machine learning, and computational tools to give local governments and communities the neighborhood scale data and resources they need to better match with lived experiences and respond to and mitigate extreme weather events. Before I hand the podium over to Congressman Doggett, I want to recognize the key role that he's played in all of this. A few months ago, I learned that Congressman wanted to connect with Dr. Dev Naogi, one of our great faculty members at the, at the Jackson School. Apparently, the Congressman caught a TV interview with Dr. Naogi and wanted to learn more about his research. I'm told this is a uniquely different, difficult year for community projects like this one to get funded in Congress. But Representative Doggett defied the odds in managing to get funding set aside for this project and into the relevant House Appropriations Bill. There are a lot of important lessons here, uh, but one of those is that having a fierce advocate for uh, learning more about the world, creating positive societal change, and for the University of Texas at Austin and our researchers is important. And we're really grateful, Congressman Doggett, for all you do. Uh, it, he's one of our alums, two-time alums, and former student body president here at the university. Uh, so to all of our students, you never know what will happen. Uh, so thank you, Congressman, for your general, generous assistance and for all you do on so many occasions to help UT Austin and the broader Central Texas community. Uh, we're lucky to have you in the family. So with that, I'll turn it over to Congressman Doggett. Thank you so much, and thank you for your leadership here on the 40 Acres. So way back in 1965, when I was a freshman student here at UT, President Lyndon Johnson's Science Advisory Committee published a report that focused on air pollution. Uh, and one chapter was called the, referred to the invisible pollutant, the rising level of carbon dioxide. It tied this pollutant directly to fossil fuel use and outlined the potential consequences in terms of shrinking polar caps, rising sea levels, and higher and higher temperatures. Today, decades later, decades of inaction regarding this invisible pollutant, uh, we're suffering the effects of climate change right here in Central Texas. A heat index approaching 120 degrees one day in Austin this summer. Wildfires all around us. Smoke uh, from those fires, smoke from Canadian fires that turned the skies over Washington, D.C. and New York City orange. And, uh, of course, the dangers of infectious diseases, of the West Nile virus we never had before, malaria here in Texas, uh, along with hurricanes, droughts, and other weather extremes. One local newscast that I saw uh, last week suggested we needed to water our homes because it was so hot and so dry that foundations could begin cracking. Certainly containing this escalating climate crisis requires major national and international action in short, uh, just as that first report from President Johnson suggested, we need less fossil fuels and less fossilized thinking. Our efforts in Congress uh, this past year uh, helped uh, emphasizing greater energy efficiency and electrification, incentives for more families to get involved and be a part of the solution, and incentives for more renewable uh, energy production overcoming obstruction of those who reject climate science is certainly very important. We can't get the job without overcoming that obstruction, but we just can't wait here in Austin for state and federal action that's been so long in coming. That's why I think, uh, Mayor and Council Member, the Austin Climate Equity Plan is so very valuable, 
and why we need to continue working together locally to deal with these issues of weather intensification. Uh, as President Hartzell mentioned, uh, each member of Congress has the opportunity now to request uh, some federal funds through what are called community projects. I've been targeting mine since the first opportunity became available toward climate change in large measure, beginning with uh, funds uh, that I got for the Meadows Center down at San Marcos uh, to study water and the impact of climate change on water and how city managers and other people all over the state of Texas can deal with the less water that we will have as a result of climate change. And I secured some funds uh, here for foundation communities to add solar to their affordable housing. And uh, because the impact of climate, uh, like so many other things, is always felt more by communities that are disadvantaged, largely communities of color, recently working with the city on uh, stream rehabilitation and green stormwater uh, infrastructure out in the St. John's neighborhood. Today, I'm pleased to announce that while the check is not yet in the mail, I've secured initial approval for one and a half million dollars for the UT's City Climate Collaborative to build local scale fire, heat, wind, ice, rain, and other extreme data portals that can better inform families and neighborhoods about how to deal with the impact of the climate crisis. This This funding should be finalized by year end. Uh, the funds will pay for faculty, postdocs, and student teams to develop the tools that will help us cope with the ever increasing uh, climate and global warming. Just across uh, here in Travis County, and we see this time to time with the rare rain we've had lately, there are a lot of variations. There are variations across our county in terms of uh, hot spots, uh, where we get rainfall, flash floods, and wind fields. These funds, along with the investment that the city is making under the leadership of Council Member Alter, uh, provide mapping to show the neighborhoods that are most susceptible to danger uh, and better inform families about the risk that they face uh, from, uh, along with all of our governments, from ACC to CAP Metro, uh, on where it's most important to plant trees, uh, how to develop uh, resiliency hubs, and where to add shade structures and green space. Wildfires, and we have leadership from our firefighters here today, uh, have certainly been an almost daily concern uh, throughout Central Texas in recent months. We can turn to national satellite models, as we often see on TV, uh, to show where large wildfires are actually located, but these larger models do not show us how the smoke will spread uh, given the wind direction, the uh, building heights around there and other local infrastructure, and given the amount of green space. We're often unable to predict the neighborhoods, the schools, and the communities that will be impacted first, and that's so very important. So UT has already partnered with the Austin Fire Department uh, on a preliminary proof of concept to map these wildfires, and some of the money uh, that uh, I'm obtaining uh, will pay for new research uh, to expand on this, use AI and machine learning to build upon the initial proof of concept to deliver valuable information uh, to the fire department, to local neighborhoods, to the forestry department. Uh, data that can make emergency alerts more accurate, targeting firefighting personnel more precisely, and prioritizing mitigation efforts uh, like debris clearing uh, to avoid the dangers of another ice storm. Uh, UT's research is very important on this, and there's, just as we've had federal city collaboration, uh, we have great collaboration here among Longhorns. Uh, UT's Jackson School of Geoscience and professor, who, who is the one I saw on TV, Dr. Niyogi, uh, whom you'll hear from shortly, uh, the School of Public Affairs, Professor Patrick Bixler, who's here, and the School of Architectures, Professor uh, Jun Fung Rial, Jiao. I may have looked close. <laughs> uh, additionally, the city is working with UT to develop a brand new co-lab on climate to be launched in coming months, and this project will be one of the first funded initiatives. Our local governments and our community organizations are working with leading researchers here at UT to help us get some answers about the right tools to cope with this ever-increasing 
uh, in weather intensification. The data gathered on variations uh, from neighborhood to neighborhood, block to block, will help us adapt and respond to the immediate dangers while we continue demanding that federal and state elected officials act to prevent this condition from getting even worse. So next up is Mayor Kirk Watson. He has a long history for the environment, having worked with Governor Ann Richards on air pollution long ago, serving us as state senator, as mayor, and coming back for a rerun that's been very effective, longtime leader on the environment, uh, our mayor, Kirk. Well, thank you all very much, and Congressman, thank you, and I, I want to say a special thank you to Congressman Doggett. Not only is he, in a general sense, a great leader when it comes to issues related to climate and the environment and what we need to do, but as, as President Hartzell pointed out, he gets really specific about it, and he makes sure that uh, in Congress he's an advocate for us and, and bringing back the ability for us to do other good and big things because he's able to get uh, grants like this. So uh, let's give him another round of applause and say thank you. Uh, he, he said it very well, and, and I want to just say a couple of things, and then I'll, I'll sit down. But I, I want to emphasize the partnership between the University of Texas at Austin and the city of Austin. Uh, that, is a, that is a key partnership, and on an issue like this, it is the kind of thing that we need to have. We need to recognize that a lot of the good in Austin, Texas starts right here on the 40 acres, and a lot of good right here on the 40 acres is a result of the city of Austin. And so to have this kind of partnership, Mr. President, I, I deeply appreciate that. I also want to say uh, that I am proud of the role that the city of Austin plays as a leader when it comes to issues related to climate change. And you're going to hear in just a minute from uh, Council Member Allison Alter, and I'm glad that that's going to happen because uh, she has played a role in leading on that and one that, that we ought to uh, pay attention to and follow. I think you will see even more uh, as we go forward. We're, we're outside, which kind of surprised me, I must admit. When they told me what was on my schedule and said, they're going to do that in the mall or whatever, the, I guess they call it the mall, and I said, we're, go we're going to be outside? Um, because that's the first reaction, right? right. At, at this point in, the, in this today, is supposed to be one of those days that our low will be the highest low we've ever had, and the high will be the highest high we've had for this day. We are no longer debating do we need to do things? We are no longer debating the issue of climate change. There may be some, but we'll let them stay outside. The truth of the matter is we know we need to act, and this sort of uh, effort makes all the difference. So with that, I'm going uh, I'm to avoid filibustering on climate change, and instead I'm going to bring up uh, Dr. Dev Niyogi, whose name you have heard multiple times, and Dr. Niyogi is the project lead and professor at the Jackson School of Geosciences and the Cockrell School of Engineering, and let him talk a little bit more specifically about this project. Thank you all very much. Well, here we are, and it's a real pleasure. Uh, yes, we chose the best day today without rain, and uh, that was not an easy task. Uh, President Herzl, uh, Congressman Doggett, uh, Mayor Kirk, Council Member, dignitaries, colleagues, students, and esteemed members of the media. Uh, first of all, I must start by saying on behalf of colleagues at UT, uh, researchers representing multiple colleges and departments and our partners at the city and groups within our community and also all the students and partners and well wishes we have. I offer a deep heartfelt thank you to Congressman Doggett for his incredible and active leadership on this issue. Uh, you already heard from President Herzl how, he, how the Congressman made this possible. Uh, we are grateful indeed for the vision that you have taken the concept that I pr briefly presented on a television interview, and here we have crystallized it into a project just a few months from where it all started. So thank you very much for that. The 
Congressman, this project, as you know, is very timely. And it is not just because of where we are in terms of the climate and the tools that are needed, but the tools and data sets that we are going to create at a neighborhood scale are really going to provide the city of Austin and the county more broadly with the knowledge and tools that are needed to address the threat of extreme weather, such as heat waves or ice storms that we heard of or even extreme droughts. And yes, we do get our occasional rain. And when it rains, it does pour here in Austin. And winter ice storms have been a part of our climate now. And to protect us from the most vulnerable communities that are affected by this, that is what these tools are going to be used. So researchers at the University of Texas and also the city of Austin have been starting to work together on projects to address climate extremes. And you heard from Mayor about some of the issues, and um, Dr. Alter will be talking more on that. And your support provides a direction and a federal partnership that is bound to make the results even more impactful and take us to a direction that we have always strived to do, to be excellent at what we do. Um, the Jackson School of Geosciences has, in fact, just started a new climate science major. And there are other UT programs, both in sustainability, environmental sciences, policy, and justice, and they are also growing at UT. This project, as you know, will help undergraduate and graduate students and host of research pathways, as well as opportunities to build new and purposeful community partnerships, and we're looking forward to that. So Congressman and dignitaries, in closing, I offer my heartfelt thanks again, and one final observation. We are in an era which I called SIMBY, C-I-M-B-Y, climate in my backyard. Our decisions regarding infrastructure planning, our resilience mapping and response, they need this information of highly localized climate in our backyard. And I'm looking forward to sharing the tools and data sets that emerge from here and the progress we will achieve uh, over the years from now. And this SIMBI tools of climate in my backyard are going to be the way forward. So thank you again. And I look forward now to introduce another UT supporter and our climate champion, Austin Clown Council member, Dr. Alison Alter. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Nyogi, President Hartzell, Mayor Watson, and especially Congressman Doggett for your commitment and your vision to help us address climate change right here at home. I know that together with UT's Planet Texas 2050 and the City of Austin sustainability and resilience efforts, this research project is going to help us do more than generate models. It's going to help us to adapt to climate change, which is why we need this work. It's not just about the academics. It's about taking what we know here at UT and helping our community. As many of you know, I'm married to a UT historian. So I, for better or worse, have learned that we need to learn from the past. Uh, as a council member, I've confronted uh, climate disaster after climate disaster. And it's really important that we heed the lessons of these disasters so that we can prepare for the future. That is, in fact, why we do after action reports, why we do audits. We want our past mistakes to inform our preparedness efforts and make us more resilient. So too must we learn from our infrastructure planning efforts and where we failed. I will never forget after Winter Storm Uri when I reread our 2018 Climate Resilience Action Plan for City Assets and Operations. The plan highlighted four key climate hazards based on the climate models that we had. On a day like today, three of those are gonna sound very familiar. Extreme heat, drought, wildfire. There was only one more, and that was flooding. So you can imagine, in the aftermath of Storm Uri, the shock that I had to see that our models did not predict the extreme swings. Our models did not um, predict an extended freeze as something that our infrastructure had to worry about. That is a problem. And that is why we're here. We need better climate models to guide our local choices. With climate change, I've heard um, Professor Nyogi say, you can't just simply look at past data to predict the future. You need to interrogate many scenarios, and you need skills and knowledge to build scientific models and to translate them for use by others. What the um, 
researchers know has to be translated so that the person who's planning things for Austin Water can use it in their plans. I had the honor of meeting Professor Nyogi, who's also my constituent this spring, when we both spoke at our annual wildfire symposium, and we have been collaborating ever since. One comment he made really, really stuck with me. Though we know temperatures are rising globally, global predictions alone won't help us understand the local. This project that we are celebrating today is designed to provide local decision makers in and out of government more dynamic, more methodologically sophisticated ways to better understand how to build local resilience and to create pathways to collaborate with our community. It will give us more and better facts to act on and to help us be strategic in our choices. I was asked to talk specifically about how this will assist the city and I think it's important that we think about the decisions that we make every day as a city where this kind of work can assist us. We need to do things like plan the right fuel for our fire trucks, build our water pipes to withstand extreme heat and prolonged cold even as they traverse different soils through our lands. We seek to provide relief to those most impacted by the heat, equip our buildings with the right HVAC, plan where we need to site a park or anticipate energy demand. We also need neighborhood scale data and analysis to help us see and address inequities that impact of the impact that climate change change has across the city. We need better information and innovative engagement approaches so together that our, our residents and us can co-design solutions that are equitable and effective. This is why we are formalizing our partnership with UT and I'm pleased that we will soon announce the creation of the first of its kind UT City Climate Collab and that is the first of its kind for a city to partner with a university to essentially have our own climatologists that we can work with on a regular basis to help us address these needs. To <laughs> Together, we will be able to support projects on issues like urban heat trends and securing our water supply. The city will benefit from access to our own climatologists with whom we can co-produce knowledge, improve governance and policy, secure funding like that that is brought today to make us more resilient and train future leaders. At a future date, we will invite all of you to learn more about the framework and the infrastructure that we are building through the UT City Climate Collab. Today, though, I want to simply conclude by acknowledging how critical the short-term funding from this grant is to the longer-term vision for collaboration between the city and the UT to enhance community resilience. So thank you, Congressman Doggett, um, for your efforts to help this succeed. Um, with that, it is now my honor to invite my friend, Carmen Giannis, who is the executive director of Go Austin Vamos Austin, to speak. Gava is on the front lines of working with the city and the most vulnerable communities to co-design a better future, and Carmen is leading the way. So thank you, Carmen. Good morning. I'm grateful to be here. Uh, and while I may be one leader in this work, I am certainly doing it shoulder to shoulder with many other incredible leaders in this community and many who came before me for many, many generations, um, including those uh, native to this land who have been following the ways of our water and land and all the changes that our climate has been going through for a very long time. Uh, my name is Carmen Yanis. I'm the executive director of Go Austin, Vamos Austin. We are community organizers working on health equity, uh, and we work in areas disproportionately impacted by chronic health issues. They are also the areas disproportionately impacted by climate shocks and stressors that we are all talking about. And so as an organizer, uh, one of the principles we use is to learn from history. And as much as I'm used to being, for a long time, a youth, privileged to be brought up in the environmental justice movement here in Austin and with so many great teachers I'm starting to accept that I am now in the Yelder uh, category and uh, I have a couple of decades to look back on from um, the last time uh, Mayor Watson was in office I was studying climate uh, carbon cycles on fellowship and tropical biology and environmental policy and many of the things many of the predictions that uh, you know we talked about were already coming true because um, I was studying some of these things as we were watching um, from a distance, right, the horrors of Hurricane Katrina. 
and eight years later we would have our own catastrophic floods here in southeast Austin uh, that we're coming up on the 10th anniversary of that um, we are still, communities are still recovering from. Uh, and those of us who have been trying to serve those communities the best that we can um, and follow their leadership, uh, we are also recovering and as we prepare for each shock and stressor. Um, many of our North Austin neighborhoods are suffering some of the worst heat in these extremes. And yes, it's a result of climate change and, and we can talk about you know the the effects that we have been trying to mitigate for a long time, um, but we have the compounding effects of structural inequities and continued um, in, uh, in lack of accountability in land and water management that are contributing to, um, to these difficult situations. So having that analysis uh, in partnership with our researchers and some of these leading content experts um, is so critical for us because of the disproportionate impacts that some of our communities are facing, and for that reason, um, the accountability that can be found there, but also the guidance, the collaboration, the solutions, and the common interests that are going to get us through these crises. So w I, I do want to speak about accountability because I'm an organizer up here on the mic with elected officials who I love and respect and also you know, am looking to to help us find the way forward. We need accountability um, from the city of Austin uh, in its collaboration with our federal government, with our state and county. We need accountability from uh, the institutions and the elected officials that have allowed communities to be built in places and in ways that make them uh, more at risk. Communities that were allowed to be built in the floodplains, places where we have not addressed those sins of the past and created the adequate warning systems. Uh, the continued allowance of concrete as an exacerbator of heat uh, without really responsible uh, planning. Um, but there are also lots of shout outs to be made because the strength we have is in our networks. So because of the relationships that we have built across community, across the city of Austin, across uh, the University of Texas, we have been able to find ways to transform our collaborations. We, don't, we can't just be extractive to the planet, right? We've run up against those limits. In the same way, research cannot just be extractive to community. We know that we need lived experience and stories to make this data better, but how are we making things better right now for people on the ground? And we're not starting from scratch because the people who are most disproportionately impacted are survivors of climate shocks and stressors. They have found ways to anticipate, prepare, and respond, and to push on their institutions to anticipate, prepare, and respond. And through that, we've been able to find these collaborations with community-oriented, researchers like Dr. Niyogi, like Dr. Patrick Bixler, like Dr. Katherine Liebernicht in the School of Architecture, and all of these folks who have actually stopped everything they're doing to sit down and say, what does it take to engage community in a meaningful way that is not just extractive and that leans on the expertise of people who are living this and finding solutions every day. Mayor Watson pointed to specificity. It's so critical because these buzzwords we get into like resilience, they, they get lost in conversation at the leadership level, but when you go to the front lines to our first responders, including the neighbors, including the teachers, including the parents, the caretakers, right? They, they can tell you what they need right now. They can tell you what we're doing to make things better, to get people prepared. So to quote Dr. Wendy Ellis, who talks about building community resilience, no data without a story, no story without data. We need each other. Our solutions are tied up in our collaborations. We can find empathy, we can find common collaboration response. Our survival depends on it. And just to leave a few bright spots, the good news is when we truly authentically collaborate with directly impacted people and the communities that have been disproportionately experiencing things, we find solutions that help all of us. So a few examples of this is the Climate Navigator uh, experiment that has become a full robust program where we're training neighbors to train each other and parent support specialists in schools how to anticipate, prepare, and respond. How to communicate with our institutions through resilience portals. This gives us tools to have better warning systems for the entire city. Aren't we happy to be warned now when we need to turn our thermostat up even a little more and uh, prepare for a possible power outage? All of that helps all of us. We, uh, you know, we came together to look at the heat emergency, and I'm so grateful to the residents of North Austin and Councilmember Allison Alter for working with us to waive pool fees citywide. We were trying to do it in the neighborhoods most impacted by heat, 
and now everyone is able to enjoy their municipal pools and take their kids for the 30 minutes that they need to go instead of spending all day because they spent so much money, right? We are finding solutions that help all of us as we tackle these big, big challenges that require all these smart people and all this heart. So there is hope. Um, there is hope for accountability. There is hope for restoration and repair. And all of us are going to be stronger and safer as a result. Um, I'm grateful to be a part of it. And I'm grateful to be holding the door open for other communities, not just GAVA's network, but everybody, so that we can come together and find these solutions. Thank you so much. I don't know if I'm introducing anyone else. Congressman, thank you. So I think it's just a matter of whether there are any questions, and we have our experts here available to uh, do individual interviews. Any general questions before we conclude? Well, Carmen, thank you so much, and thank all of our participants, and particularly our great university for hosting us today here on the LBJ Plaza. Thank you very much.